Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for Dr. Susan Schulten's lecture, Maps in the Making of America, which will start in just a few minutes. My name is Libby Bischoff, and I am the Executive Director of the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education here at USM, as well as a history professor. And it's really my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening on behalf of my colleagues at the Osher Map Library. Dr. Schulten is visiting us this week from the University of Denver in Colorado, and she is the inaugural Osher Map Library Visiting Scholar, which was an idea that Matthew, Edney, and I drummed up earlier this fall. So Susan is the <laughs> fruition of that idea, and the first one in a program we hope to be able to put on annually. So while Susan is with us this week, she's teaching a couple guest classes, including this morning in an earlier Women Writers uh, English Literature class, which was wonderful, and then one of Matthew's classes later this week. She'll be putting on a faculty workshop here on Friday, and of course giving the public lecture and doing her own research in the MAP library. So it's going to be an exciting week for all of us. Um, tonight's lecture is made possible by a few endowed funds, and I would just like to take a moment to thank um, some of those folks, some of whom are here with us this evening. Uh, my thanks, as always, to the Osher family and to their USM Cartography Endowment Fund. I also want to thank Barbara Goodbody and the Edmund F. Ball and Virginia B. Ball Endowed Lecture Fund, who's also sponsoring this evening's talk, as well as the Matson New York Times Lecture Fund. And we're really grateful and so thankful to be able to have these lecture funds to bring scholars from around the United States and around the world here to work with our students, to work with our faculty, and to present to the greater community. So thank you so much for those of you who are here to, for making that possible this evening. We would love to see everybody back next month. We have a very busy spring um, for the opening of our new exhibition, which will be downstairs in the Osher Gallery on the first floor. And it's called All Aboard, Riding the Rails in New England and Beyond, 1830s to the 1950s. So if you know any railroad buffs in your life, tell them they've got a treat coming. And that will be up through the end of the summer and into early September. So that opening is going to be Thursday, April 18th from 5 to 7.30 p.m., featuring a lecture by the Maine State historian Earl Shuttleworth. So come back and join us in April. And I am going to turn the podium over to my colleague and Susan's colleague, Dr. Matthew Edney, Osher Chair in the History of Cartography, who will formally introduce Professor Schulten. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks, Libby. Um, it really is a great honor to be able to introduce Susan today. Um, I first met Susan in 1997, uh, when she was about a couple of years after she finished her PhD at Penn and decided to brave the shows of the International Conferences on the History of Cartography um, held in Lisbon. It was wonderful. And since then, we've been bouncing back and forth and uh, meeting, corresponding over various ideas. Um, Susan's first book, based on dissertation, dealt with how uh, geography and geographical knowledge was both taught and how it flourished in public culture in the late 19th, early 20th century in this country. Um, and it's a really sort of big theme to, to continue to work um, th the, the thread through her work. Uh, more recently, she published a great book called uh, Mapping the Nation. Uh, I should say, by the way, that these books are available for purchase out there but, uh, with Kelly Books. Um, Mapping the Nation really is a groundbreaking book. I mean, Geographical Trans uh, Imagination in America was brilliant. Mapping the Nation was just groundbreaking in terms of looking at the history of thematic mapping, uh, historical mapping, state formation, how they all wove together in the 19th century, and including a wonderful chapter that she'd published <clears throat> also in Civil War history about Abraham Lincoln, uh, census mapping of slavery in the 1860 census, uh, and how these things twirl together in terms of not just geographical knowledge, but the fundamental nature of US society and this 
problems of the 19th century. At the same time, she was also doing a number of uh, columns for the New York Times uh, on Civil War and mapping, which on the one hand I'm very envious of because it gets your name out. On the other hand, I'm not envious of because you've got to keep writing and writing and writing and writing. So, um, and just recently, and the reason, uh, one of the reasons that she's here is she just published this wonderful book also. These are all the Chicago. Um, I think this is one of the best structured books that I've seen in a, in a very long time because not only does Susan tell a history of the United States in a way that doesn't, at least to my British educated mind, omit anything of importance, but at the same time she also talks about the maps that are relevant to these phases and these moments in US history. So it's both the maps and the history all in a really nice um, integrated whole. Uh, and I really do stress, if you like what Susan has to say, um, you should buy the books from Barbara because the books are actually out of print and we're waiting for the next round to be printed. So if you want to get them, get them now. Susan is, as Libby said, a professor of history at the University of Denver, where she has been chair for I don't know how long. She's no longer chair. Um, Six years, right. So somehow she did all this work and be chair at the same time. Lord knows how that happened. Um, so it's a great pleasure I want to introduce Dr. Susan Shorten. Thank you, Matthew. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you all for coming. It means a great deal to me um, that you came out, uh, especially if you're a student and it's right after spring break. <laughs> I know it's hard to get those academic juices flowing again. Um, it's a particular honor for me to be here um, because the Osher Map Library has been so important to me over the years. Um, and there's a few people I'd like to thank. Uh, as Libby did as well, I'd like to express my profound gratitude to Dr. Osher um, because it's people like him, and there are very few of them in the United States, who have collected so intensely and over such a long period of time that they make my work possible. My work would simply not be possible if it weren't for these sustained, intense, and very large uh, collections of every type of map that one can imagine, not just high-level important diplomatic maps, but also ephemeral maps. So I'm profoundly grateful to the Osher family um, for the work they have done, the collecting and the funding of the Osher Map Library. Uh, I want to thank especially Libby Bischoff, Bischoff for dreaming up this new uh, visiting scholar program and allowing me to be the inaugural lecturer. Um, she and I have traded notes um, over the past several months and have had a wonderful time since I've gotten here this morning. Um, as she said, I was given the privilege of teaching one of the undergraduate courses this morning on early women writers. And it was in that hour and a half that I was so reminded of the tremendous privilege of working with students directly with material objects. Uh, of course, I'm going to show you these wonderful maps in high resolution, and that's fantastic. But there really is no substitute for working with students and seeing those materials up close. And so I envy Libby and Matthew of what they're able to do. Um, as Matthew said he's been a colleague of mine for 22 years. Uh, he underestimates the influence that he's had on me. He says we trade notes, but it's much more than that and bounce ideas off each other. He's been a tremendous mentor to me. And I know um, if you aren't aware, if you're not in our crazy little map community, you may not know that Matthew occupies uh, a sort of rarefied position as um, a curator, as a thought leader, as a tremendously productive scholar, um, and as, as the person who is uh, bringing forth one of the final volumes in the History of Cartography Project. So he is, he is quite something. So with those thank yous, I'll get started. A few years ago, I got a phone call from an editor in London at the British Library Press. And he asked me a question. Would I be interested in writing a history of America uh, 
defined any way I would like, that used as its primary resource, primary evidence base, not text, but maps. Not maps to illustrate what we already know about history, but a new history of America that would foreground materials, particularly those treasures from the British Library. And I thought about it for a little while. I talked to some friends, uh, many of whom were wondering, why is it that the British Library would have one of the largest collections of American cartographic material in the world. And I thought, well, that's why we need more social studies <laughs> in this country. Um, but indeed, the British Library has an unparalleled collection of early American material. They're, as you might expect, particularly strong up to um, the American Revolution. But still, in the uh, century since then, they have particularly um, rich materials on offer. So it didn't take me long to call that editor back and say that I was absolutely interested in taking on a project like this. I will be candid with you that one of the chief draws of something like that was to be able to publish my first book in color. <laughs> and for those of us who work with maps, the uh, opportunity to publish both in a slightly oversized format and a color format was something I just couldn't pass up. But no sooner had I accepted the invitation than I realized the real hard work was ahead of me. Because what would a history of America through maps look like? You don't want it to just be, as my father would say, one damn thing after another, right? You need to have something larger than that, some kind of arc and some kind of spine. And what I came up with and what I'd like to posit to you today in the next few minutes is that one can look at American history through maps in order to demonstrate why and how maps have mattered in American history. And I mean that in the broadest possible sense. And what I have tried to do in this book is to show that maps are both influencers of the past, but are also influenced by the past. And that there's a wonderful reciprocal relationship where maps both reflect and mediate change across five centuries of American history. So when I began to brainstorm what would those 100 maps would be, all of a sudden, of course, I drew a giant blank after working with maps for 15 years. But above all others, I knew that there was one map that absolutely would have to be in there, and that's this. And I'll zoom in so you can see it a little better in a second. This map is now celebrating its 300th birthday, right, as of last year. It's a map made by a man named Guillaume de Lille, who was geographer to the French king. And Guillaume de Lille was given an assignment in the 17 teens, and that was a request by the French king to create a map that would fulfill two purposes. First and foremost, the French king wanted a map of North America that was to date the most comprehensive. He wanted the best possible cutting edge on the ground field knowledge of what North American geography looked like. And in that sense, Guillaume de Lille absolutely delivered. The course of the Mississippi and its tributaries is an absolute quantum leap of improvement over representations of the Mississippi prior to that point. But at the same time, the French king wanted something else, slightly more interesting. And that was a map that would be accurate, but simultaneously lay out French claims to North America. A propaganda map, if you will. Right? And he does that, Guillaume de Lille does that rather masterfully. And I'd like to draw your attention to how he does that. Notice first and foremost that the Mississippi, which I just mentioned is represented quite accurately to that point, is also the center of the map. It is both the geographic center, but it's also the political center. And that is because for the French, the Mississippi River was essentially their claim to territorial sovereignty. To that point, there had been extensive French exploration of the far northeast, which they represent on this map, um, which de Lille represents very clearly to sort of make a claim for French control of that area. And then the French traders up and down the Mississippi, right, exploring that region primarily to develop their geographical knowledge and to lay the groundwork for what the French were really interested in, not so much settlement, but trade. And so in that sense, the map does both of those things at the same time. Right? It represents geography, but it also advances a particular geographical argument. And here also, 
is what explains the sort of unresolvable conflict that's going to develop in the subsequent decades between the French and the British. The French use the tributaries of the Mississippi to claim what they consider to be their own. And of course, that includes the Ohio River and its drainage system. The British have very different understandings of their presence in North America. They are less interested primarily in trading and more interested in settlement, colonization. And so look at the way Delisle represents the British colonies, right? Where the Appalachian chain is a geographic marker, but also very conveniently a political limitation on the British, limiting their ability to move into the Ohio Valley um, and the Trans-Mississippi, Trans-Appalachian West, right? That's in, in, uh, intentional on Delisle's part. You, can, you can't see very well, but he's marked off through color the limits of each of those British colonies. But in that Trans-Appalachian region, what we now know as the Ohio Valley, the British had very clear claims, primarily through their relationship, their suzerainty with the Iroquois nation. Right? So they considered the Iroquois as an extension of their own sovereignty in the Ohio Valley in exactly those areas where the French were beginning to be more and more assertive up the Ohio River. This map, when it was published, was, like I said, simultaneously the most comprehensive picture of North America, but also outraging the British and setting off what is known as, uh, to those of us in the map world, as the War of the Maps where the British responded in kind in order to show that the French were not as expansive and powerful across North America, but rendering their own understanding of that geography. But notice it's not just the British that they've hemmed in, that the French have hemmed in to the east and along the Atlantic, but also the Spanish that they have relegated to the far west. So I'll zoom in for you just a little bit so you can see. You can see here the way the French have marked many French and also Spanish explorers from centuries past in order to extend and to demonstrate the limits of British power and the expansiveness of other, presence, uh, other imperial presences in North America. Notice also all the identification of these Native American tribes, which to the French were useful as potential allies, potential sources of labor, given that they weren't intensely interested in settling the drainage system of the Mississippi, right? And so for all these reasons, this map is a masterpiece. It tells us the state of knowledge of North America at that time, but it also recaptures a particular moment in time in terms of geopolitics. And for both of those reasons, this map is essential to the kinds of stories I want to tell, where maps record a certain state of affairs, but also influence that state of affairs. As I said, this map sets off a whole firestorm of controversy and responses on the part of the British. It is also simultaneously published with the founding of New Orleans, uh, the French um, port, um, which they project to be the opening sort of stage of their entry into North American commerce in a more intensive way. But for all the things that this map does, and there, it does a considerable number of things, it is incomplete. It was only a particular kind of map and only one type that I wanted to include. So for instance, at the moment this map was published in 1718 is the height of an intense conflict in the American Southeast known as the Yamasee War. And you don't see any indication of that here in the eastern edge of Carolina. But the Yamasee War was a tremendously deadly conflict between the tribes of the American Southeast and the very fragile colony of South Carolina, which wasn't that old at that time. That conflict sent tremendous um, devastation through the deerskin trade, which hurt both the South Carolina colony and also those tribes, created very, very real turmoil and almost wiped the South Carolina colony off the map. In the aftermath of the Umassi War, the Crown send, appoints a new uh, governor of South Carolina and sends him with a very particular set of instructions. Among those is 
to solicit and reach out to those southeastern tribes to repair those relationships that were so devastated by the Yamasi War. And so Governor Nicholson arrives. He sets up that very important meeting with the tribes. And he finds out when he meets them that the tribes have their own agenda. Because at that meeting, he is given this map. And I'll give you a minute to kind of wrap your head around it. It is, in fact, a map. It may not appear that way at first. My colleague saw a reproduction of this map on my desk. And she said, you know what that looks like? A very confusing organizational chart, <laughs> which it does. <laughs> it's an organizational chart where you're not sure who's on the top. What you're looking at here is a map drawn on deerskin. It's one of the treasures of the British Library, just like the last one I showed you. We don't have a precise date, but we can pretty reasonably uh, conclude that this map was made on, at about 1720, 1721. And it was given to Gov Governor Nicholson at that meeting in order to convey a particular proposal. And the best research we have on the map indi oop, pardon me, indicates that it was drawn either by a Cherokee or a Chickasaw leader and given to the governor with the proposal of creating an exclusive trade arrangement between those tribes and the new port of Charleston in South Carolina. An exclusive trade arrangement around deerskin at the time they're trying to rebuild that trade, one that would advantage the new colony of South Carolina and particularly that new port of Charleston against Virginia, the older, the more settled, the more powerful colony to the north. So if it's helpful to you, if you think about this and you turn it 90 degrees, you can see, at least on the Atlantic coast, right, the geographical reference points of Charleston and then Virginia to the north. So the proposal of the tribes creating this arrangement exclusively with the colony that would advantage Charleston and would also advantage those tribes over the others. And so what you see on the deerskin map is a representation of geography, but not in terms of absolute physical space. Instead, it's a representation of geography based on relationships and power, where the tribes are represented according to their relative power in the southeast, right, um, and the relationships between them. So one thing I'd like you to notice is that there's no line that connects the Cherokee and the Chickasaw with the colony of Virginia, because that relationship had recently ended. Right? And it's this representation of space at a particular moment in time that is, for me, as rich as that Delisle map that I showed you made for the French king. It captures a moment in time. It restores a sense of contingency. It reminds us of the power wielded by the tribes in the southeast when South Carolina was but a new colony. right? And it also reminds me, and should remind us, of a particular moment of transition in the American Southeast. In other words, in some ways, this is a map of an entire region, right? not just of a particular relationship. And in the 1720s and 30s, as deerskin was becoming less profitable, there was a new source of wealth developing in its place for South Carolina and that was rice. But rice doesn't depend on the labor of Native Americans. Rice depends on a settled, <coughs> controllable labor force. And of course, you see where I'm going here, right? For rice to be successful, South Carolina would have to invest very heavily, as its northern neighbor did, Virginia, in slavery. And that's what begin begins to bring South Carolina into the growing Atlantic trade, and particularly the Caribbean trade around slavery. Right? And so what, partly what you're seeing, even though slavery, of course, and rice is not represent, represented on here, but this is a moment of a re set of relationships and trades that are beginning to die out. Right? The last thing I want you to think about with this map is the way in which it was given to the governor at a moment when he had an agenda of his own. And that's a nice reminder for me that the tribes wielded very real power at a moment when South Carolina was not just fragile commercially, right, and needed protection from particular hostile tribes, but also think about the French that I was mentioning before who becoming increasingly assertive 
moving from the Mississippi eastward. In that context of growth, the tribes offer a very important buffer right, and source of stability between the French and the British. Right? So a map like this tells me so much in so many different dimensions and in a rich way that represents space in a non-European fashion that I think is also very important for readers to see. I'll zoom in just so you can see a little of the detail. Here is the inscription of the map given to um, the governor of um, South Carolina, who then sends it to um, the Prince of Wales in England. Okay. To go back to our initial example, this map and the native map are made at precisely the same moment in time, right? Late, te late 17 teens, early 1720s. In the subsequent decades, the relationship between the British and the French rapidly deteriorates. And it's primarily around that area I was mentioning before that comes to be known as the Ohio Valley, right? Setting up that, that unresolvable conflict because there's two completely different ways of defining claims of sovereignty. And ultimately, the only way that those are resolved is in war. In 1753, the governor of Virginia, Dinwiddie, notices or hears that the French are beginning to move down from the far northeast onto Lake Erie, setting up forts that they then plan to connect with their developments coming up from the Mississippi. Right? And Governor Dinwiddie won't have any of it. So he decides to send a very clear message to the French military on the shores of Lake Erie at what is now Presque Isle, that French fortifications will not be tolerated on British land. And the way he sends that message is to give a note and an, um, create an emissary in 21-year-old George Washington. And he sends George Washington from Williamsburg up the headwaters of the Potomac, over through forests and mountains, down this area, all the way to the shores of Lake Erie, where George Washington delivers the message that the French must cease, cease and desist. And the French commander at Fort LeBeouf says, no. <laughs> so George Washington turns around, makes the return trip, and in January of, eight, of 1754, reaches Williamsburg and the governor and explains that he's been turned down, right? But he says, we may not have changed their minds, but look at all I've learned in the process. And thankfully, that map resides in the British Library. What we don't know is whether that, <clears throat> the one you're looking at is in George Washington's hand, the original, or one that was copied from his hand. So we simply don't know that. Um, but to me, it's good enough. <laughs> Because we do know it was created in January of 1754. It's a very small map. And what George Washington explains is, here's that route he took up the headwaters over the mountains, down at the confluence of the Monongahela and the Allegheny River, where it meets up with the Ohio. You can see he's even told you the course there. Down there, heading down to the Mississippi this way. right? And he takes us on his route all the way up. And on the way up, he met with uh, allied Native Americans. He met with French sailors who were exceedingly drunk one night and told him their plans, <laughs> told him how many folks they had. When he gets all the way to Lake Erie, he is very politely rebuffed here. But in the meantime, he's cooling his heels, and he pays attention to how many French sailors he sees coming back and forth across Lake Erie, and how many soldiers he sees on the way up and the way back in order to extrapolate what the French military strength really is in that. So when he gets back, he explains all this to Governor Dinwiddie. And I'll read you um, the quote on the map because it's a little bit hard to see. The French are now coming down from their forts on and near the Lake Erie to Venango to erect another fort. And from thence, they design to the forks of the Monongahela and to the Logstown and so to continue down the river building at the most convenient places in order to prevent our settlements. A little below Shanapin's town, right here, is the place where we are going to immediately build a fort as it commands 
the Ohio, and the Monongahela, right? And they do, they go ahead and build Fort, what becomes Fort Pitt. As soon as they do, war breaks out, right? So George Washington gets back in January of 1754. He says, we have to go and fortify this area um, in order to prevent the French from moving into British territory. Governor Dinwiddie creates a force, outfits them, sends them there, they build the fort, and the French promptly grab the fort. They have superior forces, right? But that is what launches the French and Indian War, right? And for years that war is waged. And for me, one of the things that's most powerful is that in a worldwide seven years war, right, what is really being fought over is a remote scrap of land right, in the interior of North America that neither imperial power really has any claim to at all, right? And that there are, of course, other residents of that uh, were there long before they were. But in any event, at the end of that war, the British are victorious. And they eject the French not just from the Ohio Valley, but from North America altogether. This is a turning point in North American history, if not in world history, right? And so the British are victorious and this is the map that begins that. The greatest irony, of course, is that the British are victorious and eject the French. And less than 20 years later, the British colonists are again fighting against a force that is greater than they are. In this case, it's not the French. It's the British crown, right? And who helps them in that fight in the American Revolution? It's the French. <laughs> and who leads that fight? It's George Washington, and in part because of the tremendous geographical knowledge that George Washington had gained. Right? So maps like this can also be windows onto specific decision making at particular moments in time. Exactly 100 years after this map was drawn, I want to show you one that's a very different view. I've shown you sort of powerful diplomatic maps. I've shown you one from a French perspective a native perspective, a British perspective, and I want to show you a very different one from a German perspective 100 years later. One that's very ordinary. Unlike those that I've shown you, it's a printed, commercial, published map. It's, it's mundane. It's not anything particularly valuable. But to me, it still contains layers of information about American history at a particular moment. In 1853, this map is released one of many pieces of literature designed to guide the massive number of German immigrants who are leaving after the failed revolutions of 1848 and looking to find homes elsewhere. Right? This is, of course, one of the greatest waves of immigration to that point in the United States, exceeded only by the Irish. And the Irish were coming in the 40s and 50s, of course, as the result of tremendous famine. They are coming at a moment of terrible impoverishment, low levels of literacy. They are coming out of desperation. The German migration is a little bit different. What you're talking about here are, are political refugees most of all, and people with high levels of education and skill, and oftentimes of means. And this massive German migration in the 1840s and 50s transforms the United States, creates new ideas about education, transforms American map making with their cutting edge techniques, right? Brings a generation of talented civil servants that are then used to great effect in the American military and civil services during the American Civil War, right? So this is a profoundly influential generation of immigration. And this is one of the many maps designed to guide their decision making. Right? It's a persuasive map. It's a map of the best opportunities. And I'm going to zoom in for you. I just want you to notice the traditional typog German typography right? made to be very familiar to those potential immigrants in Germany. And if you zoom in, just take a look for a second at the way in which it renders the United States 75 years into the country's um, establishment. You notice it identifies cities and towns of a reasonable size. With red, it identifies major trunk lines, railroad lines, that connect those towns 
and it's a little bit hard for you to see, but there's also this blue-green color that identifies both natural but also artificial waterways, that is to say canals. Right? This is the canal boom had sort of already peaked at that point, but it had very serious effects for the American economy. I stared at this map for a long time when I came across it a few years ago, but I decided I wanted to include it because to me, it tells you so much about the forces that would lead to the American Civil War. And it does so completely unintentionally. This is a map designed to persuade German immigrants about where they should go. Like I said, they're people of means. And so they have the opportunity not just to settle in the Northeast along the seaboard, as most Irish did, but to move inward, right, toward the West, or what was then termed the West, what we now term the Midwest. I have this fantastic statistic that I have to read because otherwise I'll get it wrong. <laughs> In 1850, one-third of Wisconsin was foreign-born. Almost all of those were from Germany. From 1840 to 1860, four million people entered the United States, almost all of them from Germany and Ireland. Right? So at that point, the greatest wave of migration, of immigration in the nation's history. So when I say it unlocks information about the coming Civil War, Here's what I mean. Where are the sources of opportunity? They're primarily in the Northeast and across the West. This is a moment of supreme importance in early American industrialization. And that is fueled by transportation, whether it's canals or railroads. Look at the way the Northeast is networked. And look at the way, for me, what's crucial when I try to impress upon this, uh, this upon my students in the American Civil War class, it's during those 1840s and 1850s years that all those industrial interests in the Northeast are successfully integrating the West into their network. And so when you glance at this map, the connections are this way. The connections are not this way, right? And they would perfectly you would expect the connections to be up and down things like the Mississippi, right? Or connecting the Ohio. But really, that's not what's happening. It's the Northeast that's more successful in reaching out and making the West a colony of its own, right? Now, compare that to the southern cities. First of all, there are fewer sources of opportunity. It makes perfect sense. Why would immigrants, who have very little except their education and their labor, move to a region that almost entirely depends upon slave labor. There's simply no opportunity for immigrants in that region, except for in certain areas of far east Texas where land was available. You also see very little connections between those southern cities. right? That is to say, this is at the height of cotton production. This is exactly the time when John Calhoun was saying, cotton is king. right? And yet, the profits from cotton are going back into slavery, not into infrastructure, not into development, right? In the same way that northern development is, is, uh, is, is under, being undertaken. And so think about that for a second. The map is made for one purpose. But in studying it, you can kind of get a sideways glance into the dynamics that would ultimately move the south and the north to a breaking point. This is not to suggest that the northern states are not profiting from slavery. They're pro profiting tremendously. But the two regions are moving in different directions, right? One doubling down on a slave economy and one hurtling forward into an industrial, urbanized economy, right? And so for that reason, a map like this to me is um, a wonderful portal onto a moment in the past. Finally, I like the map because it is that reciprocal relationship I talked about. I'm not saying that I can document that German families use this map to make decisions, but the point being that the map is designed to influence certain decisions. And at the same time, the very fact of what the map represents right, is a result of forces in history. Right? So the map is both a product of history and also a force on it. The American Civil War, of course, is known chiefly 
for the destruction of the institution of slavery, which unlocked its own force in American history and transformed American labor systems, urban landscapes, and all those kinds of things as a result of the liberation of four million individuals. The next map I want to show you is a kind of outgrowth of that, not quite as serious as the ones I've shown you to this point, and one that has become absolutely beloved among people interested in maps and design and illustration and jazz and modern culture. <laughs> this map went viral a few years ago when uh, Yale University paid $100,000 to acquire it for its map or its um, black history collection. It is about this big, <laughs> just so we're clear. And I want to tell you a little story about the map that gives you some sense of perhaps why it's so valuable or why it's so sought after. The map was created by a young man named Elmer Sims Campbell, who was one of the first African Americans to earn a degree in illustration from the Chicago Art Institute in the 1920s. Armed with that degree and that training, Elmer Sims Campbell made his way to Manhattan to fulfill a dream, which was to land a job at a big city magazine. Um, and despite his obvious talent that you can see here, he went from magazine to magazine and was serially rejected once they met him, that is to say, because of his race. Never one to wallow in rejection, uh, Sims Campbell made his way to northern Manhattan <laughs> um, and absolutely fell in love with the jazz scene in Harlem. This was helped immensely by his close friendship and uh, immediate friendship with Cab Calloway, who he met soon after arriving in New York. And as Sims Campbell tells it, and as Cab Calloway tells it, they spent pretty much every night carousing and drinking all night long and exploring the incredible jazz scene um, and speakeasy scene in Harlem. Sims Campbell draws this map in 1932 um, as a kind of love letter to that moment, uh, I guess you would say, the final stages right before um, prohibition was repealed, um, but before he would have known that prohibition would be repealed. And I want to zoom in on a little bit and give you a sense of what is just so magical about this. You can see, of course, the energy of the map, right? It ab absolutely leaps off the page. It's uh, part of what we call a whole genre of pictorial maps that peak in the interwar and the mid-century decades that Stephen Hornsby has written so beautifully about in his book on pictorial mapping that came out about two years ago. But Sims Campbell wants you to see the kind of energy that's going on in Manhattan. And for the most part, it's a sympathetic reading, right? You can see that um, he's got these wonderful vignettes about what's going on at the Savoy Ballroom where the Lindy Hop was born, one of the few integrated, actually, uh, clubs at that time, Small's Paradise, which was owned and operated by African Americans. But of course, at the major clubs, like the Cotton Club, African Americans were welcome as performers, but never as patrons, right? And that segregation is what makes Harlem possible in a strange way. Why is Harlem settled so densely with African Americans who came north during the Great Migration? Well, in part because of the lack of opportunity elsewhere, the lack of openness in terms of housing and employment elsewhere in New York. That concentration is part of what creates Harlem, right? What creates that musical energy. Along the same lines, there's been a lot of very interesting work done on prohibition recently. We tend to dismiss prohibition as a failed government experiment. We kind of laugh it off. We think about speakeasies and organized crime. But more recent work has been very serious about how prohibition was actually the birth of the modern penal state. It is the first effort of the federal government to regulate behavior, to regulate morality. right? Um, and of course, we live with that in our own age with the war on drugs. Also, I think I have a, yep, prohibition depends, like I said, on the implicit cooperation of the police. Prohibition may have destroyed those grand New York 
bars in Midtown and, of course, the neighborhood saloon. But in its place, prohibition makes possible a very robust nightlife where alcohol is absolutely open, only with the complicit cooperation of law enforcement. So up here you have a brand new nice police station <laughs> that's keeping these policemen warm as they say, what's the number, which has to do with um, gambling, of course, and they're not enforcing anything. And mayhem reigns outside, right, where there's open drinking, open use of marijuana, um, and it's a wonderful nightlife scene. But implicit in this, if you look closely, is Sims Campbell acknowledgement that part of what drives Manhattan every week is the desire of well-heeled whites to move north and experience a little bit of danger and a little bit of a thrill, right? Um, so all of this is what makes Harlem possible. Gladys Bentley, featured right here, uh, took me some research, but I finally figured out that's, uh, Gladys Bentley was a very well-known performer, one of the first African-American cross-dressing performers and pianists in this case. And then finally, the thing I want to just put on your radar that's interesting to me is you have Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway and other names on this list that had become household words by the 1930s. Well, how did they become household words? In part because this is the very infant stages of radio, right? And so the map can be used in that sense, too, to talk about this new culture that's developing. The authors of Prohibition could not have anticipated the reverse effect, right? That rather than controlling behavior and creating a more traditional environment, what they were actually ushering in was a much more urbane and sophisticated um, and cosmopolitan, if you will, um, kind of American culture in the interwar period. And of course, we still live with that. With, this is the same era of, as the Scopes trial. Right, where rural, urban, cultural splits were on high display. And so for all that reason, a map like this is absolutely invaluable. I just want to show you a couple more so I can stay on track in terms of time. I think the most consequential way that maps give us a sense of history and contingency is, of course, through war. And I can show you that just through the work of one artist whose work graces the cover of the book. What you're looking at here, most of you know, is a representation of the world on the Mercator projection, a 16th century projection that was designed for navigation. That is to say, it is true in terms of direction. It, unfurl, uh, pardon me, it unfolds the Earth onto a cylinder. And so direction is true, which was necessary for navigation, but of course, scale is sacrificed enormously at the northern and southern latitudes. I show you this because for most Americans in the early decades of the 20th century, the Mercator projection was the primary and most familiar way they would have seen the world in their classrooms, in their atlases at home, in newspapers, right? And some scholars have gone on to speculate that the Mercator projection was so frequently reproduced that some Americans took it to be a representation of the world itself, right? That this is how they came to understand world geography. World War II transforms that, right? On September 1st of 1939, Germany invades Poland. And by the end of the day, Publishers Weekly reports that a map of Europe could not be found anywhere in the United States, right? That is to say, World War II sparked an absolute mania for geography among Americans, a desire to understand this new conflict. More Americans bought maps during World War II than in any other period since the armistice of World War I. Right? It drives tremendous interest in geography. But the problem is that what Americans need in 1939 and 1940 is not more maps, but different kinds of maps because this is a war that has been fundamentally transformed through aviation, and that has profound effects for geography. In 1942, FDR asked the Army to make his buddy, Winston Churchill, a Christmas present, and that was a massive globe, right, that you would see here, and once he saw it, FDR said, well, I want one for myself. <laughs> so he got one. 
But I want you to notice about the globe more than anything else that it's not on an axis. It's in a bowl meant to rotate freely. And there's a reason for that, right? Part of what Churchill and FDR have to reckon with is an era where geography has been destroyed and distance has been destroyed through aviation. What matters now is movement through space, not space alone, right? And luckily for us, I will say, as Americans, FDR had a keen sense of world geography, having been Assistant Secretary of the Navy years earlier in World War I. That mattered. And so when he takes to the airwaves on those fireside chats, he tells Americans, pull out your maps. But he also says, go back to your globes. And there he explains why sending fleets to the Indian Ocean, right? or why the Mediterranean is so important. And so Americans need to think differently about geography, but they need different maps. And the individual that supplies that demand more than any other that I can think of is a man named Richard Eads Harrison, who was actually trained, like Sims Campbell, in art and design, not in map making. And I was fortunate enough to interview Richard Eads Harrison before he died in the 1990s. And we spent a long afternoon together. And at the end of which, I said, what do you think as a map maker? And I was about to finish my sentence. And he said, I am not a map maker. I am an artist. <laughs> right? Sorry. <laughs> um, and that's really how he saw himself, right? Because he says map makers at the time, he said, what do they say? They're in a coma. They don't understand that they need to be shaken out of their bearings and to help reimagine the world for the public. And so he takes his artistic sensibility. This is one of the ways he tries to reorient Americans, by returning them to a, a sensation of looking at the globe. Now, a map like this, to many map makers, is not a map at all. They find it to be propagandistic. They say there's no point in space where this is actually the view. Right? It's an impossible exaggeration of terrain and scale. But Harrison says, I don't care. Because what I'm trying to show Americans is that the Atlantic and the Arctic and the Pacific are no longer barriers. They're lakes. Right? And with aviation, all parts of North America are vulnerable. And so he made a point on, I, I'm from Denver, he made a point on each one of these of pointing out Denver right? and Chicago. You're not as safe as you think you are. right? And I'll zoom in just on the top one, because here we are in the far northeast. There you are, right? And showing that America is vulnerable from Berlin, vulnerable from the south, vulnerable from Japan, right? Surely it's an exaggeration, right? But it's this style that he brings to his maps that he publishes all through the Second World War, right? That begin to be consumed by Americans, and they're tremendously popular. He becomes a best-selling author during the war precisely because of this approach, right? And to try to reorient Americans back to a sense of relationships and geography above all. This is one of his most popular techniques where he kind of photographs and drafts from the globe. The other is to return Americans to the polar projection, which was actually a centuries-old projection that he brought back into vogue. It tremendously distorts the southern latitudes, of course. But he says, who cares? This is where the war is being fought. right? And all of this is happening right at the time that FDR is trying to convince Americans to support the British through Lend-Lease. In that famous speech, this, is, this map, this one was made in uh, September of 1940. This one was made in July of 1941. Between those two maps and those two moments, it's when Churchill takes to the airwaves and gives a long speech at the height of the Blitz explaining to, the Ameri explaining to his countrymen the state of the war. And at the end of that, he turns to an American audience. And he knows that Congress is considering Lend-Lease. And he knows it's an uphill battle. And he concludes that speech with the famous line, give us the tools, and we will finish the job. Right? And it's Harrison who wants to shake Americans right, out of that sense of complacency and distance, those America firsters right, who think that this war is not our war. He says, the hell it isn't. Right? The lines here, this is right after Lend-Lease is passed, the thickness of the lines here indicating the degree 
of connection of America to the world, right, and to the allies through Lend-Lease. The hardest part of this book was finishing it. And I don't mean finishing the project. I mean, how do you tell the story of the late 20th century? <laughs> because I don't teach that. <laughs> After Vietnam, it's all kind of a blur to me. Um, more than that, it's not a blur. It's that I'm not really sure what the history is, right? Historians like a good long while before we begin to weigh in, uh, or at least the ones that <laughs> you want to pay attention to, have a sense of their own limitations. And so ultimately, when I tried to think about how to end this book, I punted. And this is the last image of the book, and I want to tell you why I decided to end with this. <clears throat> There's a company in Silicon Valley called DeepMap, and what DeepMap does is to create and manage the databases in the cloud that govern self-driving cars. And so as they explained it to me, their self-driving cars are outfitted with cameras and sensors. And the data from the cloud is used in those sensors to program the movement of the car down to the precision of a few centimeters. Because, of course, it matters, right, <laughs> for a car um, to be guided precisely. In turn, as those vehicles are being guided with that data, the cars are gathering new data from those sensors and sending that up into the cloud to guide other vehicles. And so what you have is a constantly moving, shifting, updated database. It is a map that will never be static. And it's also a map that will never be rendered in three dimensions. Because, of course, the vehicle doesn't need a map. What they did for me here for the purposes of, of the book was to create a kind of picture of what the car sees. <laughs> but it's really more for human consumption. It's so the engineers can kind of make sure the car is functioning properly and moving properly. And it's for the passengers so they feel better about seeing what they think the car sees, right? So in some ways, the map is unlike any other in the book. It is not three-dimensional. Dimensional. It is not tactile. It will never be static or even physically seen, right? But in another way, part of the reason I wanted to end with this is that it reminds us of the very function of maps to begin with. And that is about exploration and movement and discovery and reconnaissance, all those things. right? And so in some ways, the map reminds me of the very first map in the book. And what you're looking at here is a map that historians of cartography date to about 1490. It is a map of the world as it was understood from the ancient period up to the eve of Christopher Columbus's voyage. That is to say, a world made up of Europe and Asia and Africa. So it is very, very old. It's a recovery of a Ptolemaic map, right? a classical map. But it also, if you look here, has all these notations along the coast of Africa integrating the latest discoveries by Bartolome Diaz when he came back in 1488. So just two years before we think this map was created. The reason I begin with this map is that it is this document that influences a famous globe that comes to be very pivotal for Christopher Columbus as he decides not to sail south as Diaz did to reach the Orient, but to sail from the Iberian Peninsula straight west. His calculations were wrong, tremendously wrong, in terms of mathematical distance. Right? And there is no small matter of a new hemisphere. Right? <laughs> Christopher Columbus would go to his death believing that he actually reached the Orient. He was obviously wrong. But what's interesting to me is that in that miscalculation, based on this map, right, he, along with many other Europeans, discover, for the Europeans that is, the presence of this new hemisphere and radically transform world history. In this map's influence, it is also rendered irrelevant. And what I mean by that is the map motivates a certain kind of action, decision, right? It has, it has causal force. But in doing that, it shifts history in a direction that renders the map itself dated, right? That the Martellus map is 
as soon as Christopher Columbus sails, is no longer relevant. World maps will never look the same after 1492, right? But it's in that process of rendering something dated or irrelevant, if you will, in terms of geographical knowledge, that those maps become invaluable for historians, right? It's the old, it's the outdated, it's the irrelevant maps that, for me, are absolute magic. So thank you. I went on a little long, but I'm happy to answer questions if, if you have any, or, or corrections, elaborations. <laughs> I usually get a lot of corrections. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Any idea what that was? What That's a was? ship. It does look like a parasol. Yes, it's a ship to represent that that is a port. Yeah, uh, there were two little. I'm sorry, I should have pointed that out. And then here you have an Indian a hunting yeah. with a that, uh, hunter. Another one up in the Virginia area. That's a parasol, but the, what appears to be the bigger water. Well, what's interesting, right, is that the the British colonies are rendered in terms of right angles, streets, if you will, where the native tribes are represented differently. Yeah, I got that, because those other... Um, I'm sorry, an, what... Is that an entry out to the west on the upper right? Um, I don't know what that represents. That's a good question. Yeah. You're right. That, yeah. I'm not sure. Delaware. <laughs> Delaware. Good answer. <laughs> Other questions or ideas? Go ahead, in the glasses, yeah. Uh, did you have any maps that you encountered that you just couldn't find a way to put them into your book, and what were they? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think what I had were maps that I really wanted to include, but they, uh, they wouldn't make sense in a book this size. So in some instances, what I did was just to reproduce a piece of it so you could see it. But many, and um, we have some map experts here, Stephen and Matthew and others, many important, if you will, maps are huge. And so rendering them was really difficult in a book. Even though it's oversized, it's not that large. So I had a lot of those ended up on the floor. I mean, not literally. I wasn't even <laughs> barely allowed to touch them, <laughs> much less put them on the floor. Um, so a lot of them didn't work for that reason. And I would say that. There are just so many beautiful maps. So what Stephen works on, pictorial maps, are, um, are just gorgeous. But I couldn't really justify more than three or four of them, right? So there are some areas where there's kind of a golden age of mapping, right, in certain periods. But I had to try to do justice to geography and to time. So that's, that's kind of what the, the trade-off was. Yeah. Did you have a question in the red? Um. Mm -hmm. I think, at least in the southeast or right, um, and I would say the part of the nomadism that um, you're thinking of is a little bit more associated with trans-Mississippi tribes. That's one answer. West of the Mississippi. Yes, right. Um, <clears throat> did you want to add to, or do you have more questions? Oh my goodness. Um, yes. Is Joliet after La Salle? I don't think so. Uh, yeah. yeah, after La Salle, yes. Right. You might be right. I don't know. Stephen, do you want to weigh in? No, you have more to do. La Salle is first. That's what he said. Yeah. Yes, his question was, was LaSalle the first to see the Mississippi? European. First European. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> Good reminder. In the back there. Uh, yes. Uh, I had a question. You mentioned uh, the uh, French, uh, the British Wars. Mm -hmm. 
Well, there's two different, right, I think we're talking about two different things. One is the conflict between the French and the British, and the other, 20 years later, is the conflict between the British crown and the colonists. So I'm not sure which one you're asking me about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's partly, partly true. And in fact, the book, um, what it has is a reproduction of what's called the red line map, which is the map that King George uh, was given with the actual annotations that settled the conflict between the British colonists and the crown at the Treaty of Paris in 1783. And in that map, you can really see what you're talking about, and that is to say, the French define the westward edge of the British colonies as about here. The British define the westward edge of the colonies here, right? And what they're fighting on, fighting over, is the area in between. And so ironically, the fact that the British had negotiated a far western boundary when they ejected the French, so that is to say a boundary with the Spanish, the fact that they had negotiated this far western boundary ultimately extended the westward reach of the United States when it was born. Do you see? There's all these ironic ways in which diplomacy um, ends up working out in the Americans' favor. <laughs> surprise, surprise, right? <laughs> but I do think that what your main point is that this is the real contested area, right? Um, and during the American Revolution, um, some of the earliest, you don't see it, of course, on this map, but the earliest Trans-Appalachian settlement is all over that contested terrain in Kentucky, right? So that's one good example of what you're talking about, right? Um, and not really legal, if you will, until the, the crown is defeated. Yes, that's what I'm saying. We're talking about two different wars. French and Indian War is, let's see, 1754 to 1763. Um, the American Revolution, 1776 to 1783. But what I'm saying is the lines that are drawn as a result of the French and Indian War have tremendous consequences for the creation of the United States 20 years later. OK? Oh, go ahead. Do you have any thoughts about the advent of GPS? Oh. <laughs> I thought I was going to get away with that. <laughs> um, my knowledge is very limited. Uh, most of my knowledge comes through Stephen's lovely wife <laughs> and Knowles, who's taught me a little bit about, about GIS. I think what historians and geographers are doing with GIS to shed light on history is tremendous. What I don't know is 
as someone asked me about this book a few months ago, what would a book like this look like in a hundred years? Do you see? That is to say, how, how are maps being archived at all? I mean, I know they are, but I, I don't quite have the bandwidth to understand what a static map even looks like in, in GIS anymore. Um, do you have thoughts about that? You see, I'm punting. Mm-hmm. understanding of space and time, distance, things like that. That map reading does something? The map and reading does. It's like cursive writing. You know, you're, 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 there's a logic that says if you write cursively, you know, you're relating better to what you're producing. Uh-huh. Right, right. Do others have thoughts about that? Because I think a lot about it, but I don't have any good authority on this. Go ahead. The question of Ron's is that, um, you know, younger generation that didn't, that always had GPS. Mm -hmm. They're three blocks away from the bagel shop. They live in the neighborhood, and they punch in the bagel shop address to get to it. And even so, you know, longer trips in Maine to go and many back. Which everything's relied on the GPS to turn, and they're never looking at the bigger picture. So do you think what is lost is a sense of, I can't see the other gentleman, is a sense of uh, geographical relationships? Is that it's, yeah, yeah. so not the A to B, not the wayfinding, it's the larger how your brain relates. Right, right. And how you fit into the landscape. Which is interesting because you're always the center of the map now. Right? <laughs> you are quite literally <laughs> the center of the universe. It's still a map on your phone, and you're following along the trees of the map, but there's nothing. There's no context. Yeah. You know, you're using it as a map. Hannah, should we make you answer this since you're a young person? <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting. They're sort of artifacts, aren't they? Like my son is, uh, he's obsessed with um, uh, Denver's bicycle maps, and he puts them up on his wall. Um, I mean, he used them for years to bike, but they're sort of, they're interesting to him, but in a slightly abstracted way. Do you know? Um, someone in the blue. Right, and you point to something I hadn't really made clear, but the maps that constitute this book are, are more dissimilar than alike, right? I mean, so Stephen, the maps that you work on, um, very few of them are designed as navigational tools, right? Um, they're symbolic or representational or evocative, right? Um, and so for Harrison, um, and this is one of the reason map makers hated this, but no one uses this for any kind of navigation of space. It's to make a point, right? There's only one point of perspective into this map. You, you, you don't look down on it the way a map is traditionally. The conceit, of course, is that you're omniscient, right? And the, the map is the same no matter where you are on top of it. That's not true here. There's only one perspective, one line of sight. So they're very, very different in things I'm, I'm very, I guess I'm being generous to myself that all 100 items are equally a map, right? They're, they're different types of artifacts. But to me, they're all evoking a particular moment in time in a way that I find really fun and useful and enjoyable. Go ahead. What came first, the map or the compass? Uh, the map. Yes, yes. yes. 
Uh, I don't know. Where's Matthew? He might know the origin. Oh, he's only going to come back when he's needed. You're only coming back when you hear your name. What's the origin of the compass? I'm getting really hard questions. <laughs> What's the, the origin of the compass? Yeah, so the, so the Chinese invented the compass sometime around about 1,000 or earlier. And I suppose there's always been people drawing maps. Right. And, and the, 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 there are pre, I mean, going back into the ancient period, there are itineraries for sailors going around the coasts. So there's a guy called Hanno who in like the third century BCE went around Africa. Um, BCE? BCE, yeah. And, but the compass does not get introduced into Europe until early mid 13th century. And what's really interesting is right after that, you start to get the first marine charts of the Mediterranean. And so the question is, does marine chart, the so-called Portland chart, do they come from mm -hmm. the introduction of the compass? But there's a recent study, which I don't actually hold with, but he's trying to argue that there are older forms of marine mapping that predate the introduction of the compass, actual graphic rather than itinerary. Um, but I think that the, for marine mapping, it's, it's in our modern tradition, it post-states the introduction of the compass. Mm -hmm. But other kinds of mapping, property mapping, regional mapping, boundary mapping, sort of inequality, um, they go back well into the ancient period. And there's no need for urban mapping. There's no need for the compass for those. Mm -hmm. Glad you're here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Edney. <laughs> I'm going to give Libby the last word. Mm -hmm. Right. How do you ensure those stories can be told? What types of things did you do to make sure I see it in the Harlem map, I see it in the Native American map, but what are some of the things you thought out to make sure that underrepresented voices made their way into this narrative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did, um, both in subject and authorship. Authorship is harder, right? There are not that many Sims Campbells. Um, there are some, right? So W.E. Du Bois has pride of place for um, Gilded Age mapping, um, right next to Florence Kelly and the women who map the south side of Chicago. Um, uh, but in terms, I did try to do justice at least, if not authorship, but subject. So slavery is enormously important in this book. There are two maps of Africa, if that gives you any indication, right? Um, there's a map of, one of the opening maps is of Mexico City. Right? That is to say, there are lots of non-North American, sorry, non-United States areas that I think impinge on and tell the story of American history. So coverage is one. But you might find that it doesn't adequately represent in terms of authorship, right? Um, there's not that many of those deerskin maps. Those are treasures. Um, and for that reason, we've poured over them, right? But there are far more examples of maps made by um, British, French, Dutch colonists, right? Usually men. So I did my best um, to try to tell those stories and use those sources. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it to the reader to decide whether I, I fell short. I certainly hear from people. How is it possible that you can go on Amazon? <laughs> if you want to know how you fall short, <laughs> just go to Amazon. <laughs> um, and you'll find that I didn't include the most important Dutch map from the 16th century. Well, OK. <laughs> you know? So there's that. But as my husband said, you sort of set yourself up for that when you write a book called History of America in 100 Maps. <laughs>
right? That is to say the fun and also the, the, the dread is in the list, right? What gets on the list and what gets off. Yeah, but it was a struggle. I mean, it really was, to go back to your point, right? What, what did I want to include that I didn't? A lot of things ended up being cut because they were overrepresented. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. And I'm here all week. Tip your server. <laughs>